In our Old Testament reading today, Isaiah is addressing the collapsing nature of Israel's world. Their enemies are at their doorstep, and the relative peace they have enjoyed is coming to an end. Because they have turned their back on God, God watches as they begin to suffer the consequences of the choices they have made. Hearing their cries, God is determined that they should know that it is their self-righteousness and their deliberate betrayal of the law given to build and strengthen relationships between God and one another was the true cause for what was about to happen. Israel believes God has deserted them. And Isaiah says, no, that is not true. He tells Israel that while God will not stop what is about to happen, God promises that God will be with them through it all, thereby offering them hope that they may not only endure what is about to befall them, but that they will come out of their journey with a renewed awareness of what God's love is really like. Now, as we might imagine, that's not a very comforting thought. How can I say this? Because when I share this same hope with those who are ill, those who are facing trying times in their life, those who are beginning that journey from this world to the next, I sometimes get that, is that right look? Often, what follows is the question once asked by Israel. So how is that going to help me? It's easy for us to follow and have faith in the goodness of God when the good times roll. But when we face hardship, when it feels that God seems to be lying, blind to what we are encountering, we get mad at God. Some have even been known to curse God for allowing the troubles to happen in the first place. A few weeks ago, I saw a social media post where a person who was mad at God for taking them through some really troubled times in their life. The person cries out to God with the question we all ask, why? Why had God taken them through such rough seas? God's answer? Because your enemies can't swim. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but it reminds us that God's love enables us, like Israel, to endure whatever befalls us. Yet, even when we endure, there are times the outcome of our journey isn't exactly what we had hoped for. You see, our idea of what to expect is not always the same as God's. And therefore, we are constantly looking for what we hope for, and in doing so, we miss what God has done. This past week, during our service of guided meditation, we read the Collect for the Confession of St. Peter, and the scripture that we meditated on was Psalm 23. We also used a slightly different form of meditation this week, known as Lectio Divina. With Lectio Divina, instead of just hearing the word to help center us and prepare us for the silence of contemplative prayer, we are reminded that Lectio Divina actually challenges us to hear the word and listen to what God is telling us through it. <coughs> With the first reading, we listen for a word or phrase that
that stands out. That speaks to us in a way no other word we hear does. And then we sit in silence, listening to that word or phrase as it repeats itself in our mind. After the second reading of the same scripture, we sit in silence and we reflect. Reflecting on what God is trying to tell us through that word or phrase. Or what it is that God is trying to bring us to an awareness of in our lives. After the third reading, we respond. We respond in prayer to what we have heard or what we have sensed God says to us. After the fourth reading, we rest. We rest in the silence and peace of God. Finishing our meditation with a prayer of thankfulness for God's faithfulness. The phrase that literally jumped out at me this week was, My cup runneth over. It reminded me that in the middle of all that causes me unrest, all that seems to weigh me down, God's blessings continue to flow to such an extent that my cup still runs over. All because God journeys with me through those tough times. It was then that I could see that the obstacles that I feel are nearly insurmountable are not. And I wonder if that, if that is what Israel sensed when Isaiah says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. I once read that light enables us to see the possibilities once hidden in the shadows. The context was, until light reveals the extent of what is in front of us or around us, our fears, it is our anxieties that shape our present and future. And it is hard for us to know what may, we must really overcome. Yet once light comes into the world, the path before us becomes much more clear. And we learn that what we look at and say we cannot get over, what we look at and we fear we might not be able to get around, as the psalmist reminds us, God will lead us through. Something else for us to remember. We, we cannot generate that light. Only God can. Jesus is the light that shines in our presence. The Holy Spirit is the one who guides us along the way. And God is there to hold us up when we are unable to do so for ourselves. This week, just as Israel in the time of Isaiah, we feel, at least many do, that darkness has come over us and over our land with the inauguration of Donald Trump. It may have, but not because Trump is now president, but be instead because we have placed our trust and our hope in the kingdoms and principalities of this world like Israel instead of God. Like Israel, we may suffer the consequences of our choices. And whether we look at those consequences as the result of choices made over the last eight years or the last couple months is only doing so to look to place the blame on someone else. We need to take responsibility for the choices we make. Choices that either seek relationship 
or avoid it. As someone who has walked really through spiritual darkness, I can say that while it is scary, the darkness is not all bad. It is in the midst of the darkness we learn that the things that we place our hopes in really don't help us. In fact, these things become the very obstacles we trip over in the dark. It is only in our realization that even in the midst of darkness, we are not alone. There was someone to help us guide, be guided through it. And it is then that we are able to see the light before us, guiding us, calling us. As Jesus called Simon and Andrew, to follow it, to follow it along the right pathway, <clears throat> made visible now before us. Only then do our fears and anxieties lose the power to control us, and we are able to let go of them and journey through life knowing that God's love may manifest in the birth of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only thing that has the power to sustain us and lead us beside still waters. As Christians, we are the body of Christ, alive in the world to share this good news with anyone and everyone who will hear it. News that says no matter what darkness is experienced in this life, the light of Christ shines forth, inviting and drawing all to a closeness with God. As the presiding bishop's image of a wagon wheel reminded us, as we are drawn closer to God from the edges of that wheel, we are drawn closer to one another. It is this closeness that helps us get beyond those things that divide us today and helps us see that as the body of Christ, we are one. One with God and one with each other. Knowing this, we're able to understand better something Paul tries to tell the church in Corinth later in his letter that our differences are not what separate us, are not what makes us better or worse than one another, but that is the body of Christ. They complete us and enable us to work together as one body to make the grace and love of God known to the ends of the earth. Amen. <clears throat>